It's um, Christopher Hodges, who is the author of the book that we have already revealed in the conference called Noble Automation Now. Um, he works with executives and their HR partners to succeed with high ROI, intelligent automation and change projects. He specifically helps leaders improve engagement, create innovation and build durable business solutions which serves all stakeholders. Chris is the former Northern European Intelligent Automation Leader for Accenture and Deloitte. He is also a General Electric Certified Master Black Belt and Quality Leader. He's a graduate from the U.S. Naval Academy and the London Business School. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris Hodges. Thank you, Jose. I appreciate that. I could not be more excited to be here today uh, with a group full of people who are all focused on the same subject I am. But I want to start out with Jack Welch had a problem. I I'm a little ahead of myself because this story is actually about business leadership and technology adoption. And it's also about getting the absolute most out of people who are on your teams working with you or out of yourself. But for some reason, it starts with a boxy Volvo. Let me explain that. I was in the Navy in 1996. I was leaving the Navy, my last assignment, and you might think it looked like that, right? But it didn't. It actually looked like this. It was an office building in London. I was leaving graduate school, and I was joining Jack Welch's GE. And just about the time that Six Sigma was taking off. Anybody excited about Six Sigma, process improvement, business? I mean, you know, right, I'm in an audience full of people who know what this is all about, right? So there I was, I'm leaving London, I've got a wife, I've got two kids, I've got graduate school debts and a brand new Volvo that I can barely afford even with the military discount. So the question you should ask is, why would you extend yourself for a brand new Volvo? Well, the way I grew up, I came to, val to value quality, stability, and positive affirmations from a father figure. You can start to do the math here, right? Jack Welch was the father figure. Quality was Six Sigma. And stability was this green Volvo. So we bought it and brought it out of the country. Well, it seemed like a totally natural thing to move to Silicon Valley. My wife's Japanese, so an, an Asian Anglo family. We moved to Silicon Valley. The building wasn't there then, but it's the coolest one in Silicon Valley. Anyway, so we get to Silicon Valley, and we couldn't afford to buy a house, we had to rent houses. So we were renting houses and we didn't have a dog. So while I worked like a maniac to pay off the loans on the car and the graduate school, the Volvo kind of became the family pet. It was the source of stability for the family. And that worked out well. I lived in two states and four different houses. And I mean, I think a lot of you've had jobs like this where you're moving all over the place. And that was going great until eventually I got my first executive job at GE, and it was gonna be in Tokyo. So my wife was delighted to go to Tokyo, right? That's her home country. I was delighted too, until I arrived and I met my new boss for the first time at a company welcoming party. Maybe you've been on the 36th floor of the ANA Hotel in Tokyo. There's a teppanyaki restaurant there. Now, you all know teppanyaki from Benihana, right? From here in the United States, or around the world. But the difference between teppanyaki at the ANA, that's not what the Japanese do. But the Japanese get their theatrics by taking live shrimp and putting them right on top of the gorilla with this little cover. Yikes, what people will do for fresh seafood. Anyway, so there I was at the hotel, right? I get off on the 36th floor, I stick my hand out and I say, hi, I'm Chris Hodges and I'm here to lead Six Sigma and e-business. Those are Jack's top priorities, e-business e and Six Sigma. I'm all excited. Then my boss looks at me, and he's just kind of this slow-talking guy, and he says, that's too bad, because the two parts of the business I don't care about. And I'm thinking, this is going to be a long couple of years, right? So I thought right after this, I thought, well, I feel like the shrimp on the grill, right? <laughs> he just threw me on the grill. So there I was, not, not a good situation. Um, so I think I'm gonna go back to my wife and say, honey, I think this is a huge mistake. 
And unfortunately, I look, see the look on her face, and she's del- okay, I'm, I'm going to suck it up. I'm going to make it through this craziness, right? That's my- but I had another really big dilemma. The Volvo was in the United States, and I had no place to store it. And it was going to be really expensive to bring it to Japan. So let me just ask you a simple question. Would you sell your dog? Nobody would sell their dog, right? You don't abandon your dog in another country, and that's what this car had become. So we brought it to Japan at a ridiculous expense. But thank God, because I didn't have any joy in my job, so I had my Volvo and my family, right? So during the day, I worked thanklessly, unfortunately, on Six Sigma and e-business. And we had this really cool project, electronic document approval, first of its kind in Japan 20 years ago. This was before DocuSign and all that, right? So we got all that done. And then on the weekends, you know, I would drive the Volvo around to see all these neat things in Japan. So there was, you know, a good side. Then after about 12 months, Jack Welch announces, and to those of you who don't know Jack Welch, he was like the god of business at this time, right? And what did I say about father figures, right? Jack Welch announces he's coming to Japan and he's going to hold court with all of the GE businesses, which means just like the royal courts, they all come to talk to the king, right? So he was going to do it at a four-star hotel. This is the Four Seasons Hotel in downtown Tokyo with this huge garden. I know this all sounds glamorous, but I promise it doesn't, I promise it doesn't end that way. So what does Jack do? He says to the businesses, you know, prepare your presentations. And my boss, we know how supportive he was. My boss says, okay, Chris, you get two slides and five minutes. I mean, this is my career we're talking about, right? Two slides and five minutes. Have any of you ever had to put something that important into that little time? I worked on those two slides like my life depended on them. Weeks and weeks, you know, every little bullet point, right? Because you can't say too much. Can't say... The day finally comes. And Jack is at a table just like this. That isn't the exact table. He's sitting there, and each of the businesses comes in in a parade, and they all, you know, the, the sales and the little pieces, until he turns the faithful page on the PowerPoint, and he says, okay, Chris, you're up. And that's what it felt like. <sighs> that's what it looked like. You go into complete tunnel vision. You're like, you can't see anything, but this guy, and Jack wasn't exactly Mr. Happy Face. So I'm looking at the end of this tunnel, and then I got five minutes, right? So I do everything I can. I go through the slide, you know, you know to tell my story, talk about our document approval process. I get to the end, and I pause, and I'm within the five minutes, because you don't go long. I get to the end of the five minutes, and Jack, who was insanely smart, asks two really hard questions. You know, so you, you pause, you breathe, and you answer, and you hope to God you get it right, right? So I got it right. So I think I'm done. And he pauses again, and he takes this big, thick Sharpie, and he writes, best page in the deck, Jack. What did you want to do? I wanted to jump across the table and grab the page, <laughs> stick it in my briefcase, and run, right? That would have been a career-limiting move. So I didn't do that. So the meeting comes to an end. Everyone else gives their pieces, and it comes to an end. And we all file out of the room, right? And I have to walk kind of whisper close to my boss and I'm hoping for a little acknowledgement as I go by. He won't even make eye contact. I kid you not, will not even make eye contact. All I could say was, I will never do this to one of my subordinates, right? I mean, how do you demotivate someone any faster than that? And that's when I realized Jack had a problem, but his small problem was now my huge problem, which is that some of his leaders didn't care about Six Sigma and e-business, and they didn't do much with it, which was a tragedy. Very challenging time. So since then, things have changed. I left GE, Jack left GE, uh, obviously he retired, and some things have changed. So I want to talk about some of the things that have changed. So one of the things that's changed is the supply chain that used to be the lost Ark of the Covenant in the, in the Jones movie has become every seaport in the United States, right? The chaos that's ensued that that all the businesses go through. The second major transformation is those young and -and up-and-coming people who I once was are now a completely different generation who don't put up with being treated like that, right? I wish I'd been smart enough to know that. They don't put up with that. Totally different generation. Another piece is my little document approval process, which was sexy at the time, is nothing 
compared to automation, robotics, and artificial intelligence. Another big change. And Jack retired. Guy in between, tough time, real tough time. New guy, Larry Culp, came into GE, and guess what he's focused on? You know, read the name tag, business transformation operational excellence. So the sun has risen again for all the stuff that we actually do. Fantastic news for all of us. Some things are still the same, right? Those are the things that have changed. Some of the things that are the same. And you've heard this. We all know transformations are happening now faster than ever, and they're failing. So think about that. We are destroying value faster than we've ever destroyed it before, and still failing 70% of the time. And there are millions of young, aspiring people, some of whom are probably in this room, who don't feel appreciated in what they're doing and in their jobs. They live lives of quiet desperation at work. That hasn't changed. And why? It's because bosses like mine in Japan still exist, right? So there's a challenge. What are we going to do with that? So here's the question. What does it mean? Should we just give up because, you know, some of those things are not the same? No. The answer we all know, and the reason we all came to Florida, and the reason the people who were online watching this video and all the other videos is because business transformation is life transformation. It's how we all get better, stretch ourselves, and do great things, even if we fail 70% of the time. So how do we succeed more of the time? And what does it mean if we don't do this? Well, according to the Wall Street Journal, this is what happens. People are so fed up and disgusted with the way some of their businesses operate, they're just going to go do anything they have to do on their own. So unless you want to go to work one day and have nobody else in the room, we have to figure out how to do this better. And the way I suggest we do that is we start by helping humans be heroes. Well, am I suggesting x-ray vision, you know, or the ability to jump over buildings? No, that's not what I have in mind. What I do have in mind is a different definition of heroism. For men, for women, a person who realizes more of their potential than the average person and achieves some inspirational goal, including conquering their lesser selves. So what do we know about heroism and heroes? Joseph Campbell was the leading authority on mythology in the world when he died. And when he died, he had written a book called The Hero of a Thousand Faces. Maybe some of you have read it. But I'll guarantee you, you know Joseph Campbell. And the reason you know Joseph Campbell is because he found that through mythology, cultures all over the world had the same repeating pattern. He called it the hero's journey. Whether you're a Navajo Indian, a Japanese, a Russian, uh, a, a Swahili, anything you say, you're from the Solomon Islands, it's all the same, this hero's journey. And the important part is that hero's journey is simply a mirror of how we actually live our lives or how we want to live our lives. And here's how you know the hero's journey. You may know it from The Hobbit, The Bourne Identity, The Matrix, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone and the whole series and every Star Wars movie. They all follow the same pattern. And in the end, how do you feel? Good. Because the hero made the hero's journey. And you go, okay, well, it's, are we just talking about books and mythology? <laughs> no, I'm not talking about books and mythology. I am talking about a journey. And here's what it looks like in real life. Every one of these people, you may know each of their names. You may not know all of their names. Madam Curie is in the bottom. She's the one that people don't normally know. Um, Emily Earhart is on the top right. So these are all people who did exactly what the movies did. They conquered their lesser selves to become greater selves. And just so that you think it's not just people you're never going to talk to, this one, this is some Indian woman who happened to be my only Indian female classmate at the Naval Academy and has spent more time on the International Space Station than I spent on an aircraft carrier. That's heroic. And I know her well enough to know what she had to overcome to do it. So what is the hero's journey? And I'll tell you how I think this is so relevant to intelligent automation. The hero's journey is three phases. And it goes from the unknown or from the known world to the unknown world. And the known world is what that person is doing right now. That accounts payable clerk, business mergers and acquisition person, that CEO, the world they know and they're comfortable with. And then it transforms to the world they don't know. And it goes through these three phases. The first one is separation. Separation is I'm breaking away from the old and I'm doing something bold and new. This is Luke Skywalker suddenly realizing the force exists. 
And to go from separation to initiation, most people end up meeting a mentor. Some of the people in this room are mentors. Some of the people in this room will need to meet a mentor in order to go to that next, next phase. And that's initiation, where you learn the new world. Harry Potter learns magic. Patterns repeating over in time. Dorothy realizes she's in Oz, right? And the critical phase in the initiation, according to Joseph Campbell, is the dragon. And the dragon looks like this. In some cultures, it looks like this. But in some cultures, it's other things. And in your office, it's not really a dragon. But what does it represent? It represents the barrier you must overcome to transcend your lesser self and go to your greater self. And what it usually represents is the fear you've projected outside yourself and you think it's bigger and badder and anything that you can handle. But in reality, when you hear the call to adventure and you go into the new world of initiation, it's the, it's the dragon you must face. It's Luke Skywalker facing Darth Vader. Now, what does that mean in, in a business? It means that timid young person on your team who you know is smart, who has great potential, but won't speak up in a meeting. It's the CEO who has been really successful doing one thing and suddenly is faced with a giant merger and acquisition opportunity. And he or she knows that if they screw it up, their career is over. So the hero's journey is not size. It's all relevant to the individual person. And the dragon is not unique. The dragon is different for the individual hero's journey. And finally, it's the return. This is when Bilbo Baggins goes back to the Shire and he's got the stone or the, the ring and he feels wonderful and he starts eating, right? Because that's what we do. When we finish the hero's journey, we wanna relax. We wanna go back to the Shire and rest. But what we've come back to, what we take back to the tribe is a transcendent person. You're bigger, better, faster, stronger, wiser, or maybe you have treasure in your hands. So think about that in business. Your treasure might be a reward, might be a bonus, or it might just be that you're a greater, bigger person than you were before. Or you can just stay full, dumb, and happy, right? Because you did your journey. Guess what? Human beings like to grow. The number one engagement criteria when the next call to adventure comes because they keep coming. Maybe it takes a week, maybe it takes a month. So now I'd like to roll you forward to 2017 in Stockholm, Sweden. I've moved to, to Scandinavia and I'm the intelligent automation leader for our business. And a young man named Jens, who's a director in a financial services firm, and his CEO, Gustav, are both facing the same challenge. And it looks like this. Failing financial results in their business and a, an inability to adopt cutting edge technology. They are struggling, but they're struggling from two different angles of the business, right? One's a younger, more junior person, one's more senior. So the CEO is facing reality, which is the higher you get in an organization, the sharper the knives get. The people wanna take you out of that great job. Even Sweden, when they're hunky-dory happy, guess what, Niccolo Machiavelli was a European. <laughs> So that's what the Gustav, that's the dragon that Gustav was facing, is all those forces around him, the board members, the, the senior leadership team who had their own agendas. But poor Jens, he's in operations. His dragon is, you say the word automation and the team runs for the hills because they think it means they're all gonna lose their jobs. And there's all this complexity. What is all this intelligent automation craziness? So he's got overwhelm and fear from the people he works with. Those are the dragons he has to overcome. And he's never done this before, but he desperately wants to. So one day, Jens and Gustav, the classic example, and this is exactly how he told me, Jens and Gustav get on the elevator. It's not that tall a building. I always wanna know, you know, did Jens hit all the buttons, right? Because that's what we say to everybody, right? hit all the buttons, slow down the elevator. I don't know if he did, but he gets off the elevator, gets onto the elevator with Gustav, and Gustav says, good morning, Jens. Well, from a Swedish CEO, that's an invitation for a conversation. <laughs> it means good morning. Good morning, Jens. Three minutes later, Jens has expressed his passion and he's found an opportunity. Gustav has found a potential hero. So fortunately, that's when I met these guys. I first met Jens back in Stockholm. And Jens and I sat down and I didn't know his business. I'm not Swedish but I knew intelligent automation and I knew business transformation like you know business transformation.
right? I mean, think of the, the brain power in this room and on the, on the line. So I knew that part, but I didn't know his business, but I, I could see his passion. So we sat down, it took us several weeks and lots of meetings to craft a plan that he thought would be acceptable to Gustav. And what was that plan? That plan was to achieve all the key metrics that both men were trying to achieve in the company. So by the time Jens was ready to go meet with the CEO, Gustav, he was ready. And he had a comprehensive seven-step plan to meet all the stakeholders' requirements and to make heroes. Who are the stakeholders? His colleagues, the customers, the shareholders, and in Sweden, very important, the community. So his plan touched on all the key areas that he needed to do. So he was ready. He goes in and he talks to Gustav. And Gustav can see, I can get rid of this Machiavellian problem with this plan. This is fantastic. My leaders are going to win. Everyone's going to win. He gives them the green light, gives them the people, and off they go to the races. So I was lucky. I got to work with these two men and their peripheral team for several months to implement an intelligent automation business transformation in their company. The, the stars aligned in exactly the right way. And what did it result in? It resulted in more innovation. What do I mean by that? I mean, they changed products and processes, processes because they could. The technology enabled them to change them. And they invented new products because the technology invented them to do things they could never do before. What it also gave them was more motivation. Who doesn't want to be in a business where the CEO says, go, and you can make great stuff happen, right? Well, that's what they did, right? They were thrilled. And that red line starts to go up to the green line. In fact, they were able to make the business profitable as a result of this transformation. And how profitable, you say? It was a three times ROI on the project. This stuff isn't free. You have to pay people to help you do it, right? But you can make a whole lot of return when you do it right. So this is the stuff that gets the attention of the, style, of the shareholders, the numbers, right? Everyone gets excited about the numbers. But the real benefit was a shared purpose that they built across the business. They all were now seeing, hey, we're more in this together than we thought. We can make this business transformation. We can be heroes. And that's what they did. So I thought you might want to know some of the key highlights, what went into this as opposed to just a high level thing, right? So what are those seven steps? The first is inspired and informed leadership. Yeah, no kidding, right? We all need informed and inspired leadership. In this case, Jens and Gustav had a, a couple of key points that were of more leverage than others. First, and most importantly, was to think holistically. Think across the entire business. You don't think in silos. We have all been, anybody been in a project that fixes one silo in the business and met massive resistance from the other silos in the business? Yeah, yeah I, I, <laughs> I'll bet if everyone answered, you'd be like, oh, don't make me think about that. Right, yeah, of course, that's exactly what they had to do. They had to act with knowledge. This stuff is new. So if you're not careful, you're gonna jump on the fastest little train of technology that goes by, and you may adopt the wrong thing. I'll tell you a horror story one day on that. You, it, they acted with knowledge. They understood a broad enough base of what the technology could do to use it for them. How would it work for them? Yes, I was able to help with that, which is wonderful, but they have to be the ones who act. The third piece, clear and consistent messages. What happens when your CEO kind of says something that makes you think they're not that supportive? It all falls apart, right? Because the doubt are looking for any crack. Gustav knew his number one mission was to make a clear and consistent message, and he did it. Employee engagement, which I'm going to cover in just a second as well, absolutely key, and it's not that hard to do if you know what you're doing. Now, the fourth piece, reflected glory. If you all haven't heard the term reflected glory, it means who do you think looks great when the company does really well? Gustav, of course. So the team looks great. Gustav looks great. Everybody looks great, right? It doesn't have to all be about you. Second major piece, understanding the technology. There's a lot of technology involved in this, right? And you can do amazing things if you understand the technology. So you think you're going to build this thing. You don't know, you know what it is, but you think you're going to build this thing. Well, it's much easier if you understand what the components are. So if you know this is one component to build that thing, and then there's some other components, what if you could build that? But you don't know that unless you know what the components can do. So what that looks like in technology in this example, understanding robotic process automation, where would it work and how? Understanding natural language processing, where would it work and how? Understanding chatbots, same story. Understanding virtual assistants, machine learning and artificial intelligence. 
They didn't adopt all of this in full. They figured out how to use the pieces and build falling water, which was that house in Lego before. Their falling water was a successful business. And to think toward the future. Keep an eye open to what could be coming. Third piece, a focus on value. Duh, again, of course you focus on value. Anybody been involved in a project that they did just because the CEO thought it was a good idea and nobody else did? Right? Bad idea. Or the risk guy thinks it's good or the sales guy thinks it's good, right? They avoided that. And they also avoided this. I think this is the coolest technology in the world, but I don't know what the heck you're going to do with it. And neither did they. Some businesses will use it. I don't mean to, you know, if you're an architect and you're building a house, um, actually Cody was here talking about uh, architecture and how they're using 3D in architecture. Great. But in this business, they didn't need this. This is super sexy and whatever. So you use the right technology for the business problem. And what do you do? You mine for gold. And the gold is what feeds the circle and keeps people engaged and the business successful and you can invest. Create, but it's about helping people steps, one of which is give them feedback. The fifth step, helping humans be heroes. I talked about what that hero means. This path means you sit down with a person and you say, how can we find a path that's going to help you grow? And if you find a path for everyone, everyone's on a hero's journey. So what do you do when automation might scare people? Well, in Star Wars, these wonderful young professionals were trying to save the world, but they still got stuck in a trash compactor. The way they got out of a trash compactor was to be heroes in the age of automation. The sixth was building an operating model. That sounds like a consulting term, so let me turn that into real words. Anybody been in a project and when it got to the end it looked something like this? You know, big whiteboard or, you know, post-it, and you're so proud. You're like, look at my post-it notes. Look at my string. It's going to do amazing things, I promise. Until you actually introduce it to the people who are going to do it. And then it doesn't work, right? So here's an example. This is something built without an operating model. It's the Winchester Mystery House, San Jose, California. A mystic convinced the woman who owned it, if you don't keep building, you're going to be haunted by the devil. She did. 161 rooms, 47 fireplaces, 10,000 panes of glass, two ballrooms, and doors that open to nowhere. Anybody been on a project that feels and sounds a little bit like that? Like it just keeps going and growing, right? Here's an alternative. Frank Lloyd Wright met with the Kaufman family. What do you want in this vacation house? To really understand what they wanted before he built this. And this is why. I never designed a building before. I've seen the site and met the people who will be used. Understood the Kaufmans. He understand your business. And just like Jansen Gustav understood what was going to happen, right? One little anecdote. You see those little stairs at the bottom of the picture? They kind of look cool, right? The reason they were built, Frank Lloyd Wright knew Mrs. Kaufman liked to skinny dip in the river. That's an operating model built for purpose. The seventh step was to align the incentives and culture. Charlie Munger said it best. Show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. It's really simple. Don't reward people for doing one thing and ask them to do something else. And that's what Jensen Gustav focused on. These seven steps are what I call the noble automation now method. They became the genesis of my book. They became the genesis of my book because I saw them work so successfully. And I know what the alternative looked like. Why do I call it noble? Noble comes from noblesse oblige. That's a term used by the European royalty for hundreds of years, years, and it meant the inferred responsibility of privileged people to act with generosity and nobility toward those less privileged. It means treat your people well, and you can keep ruling. Treat your people badly, and you might lose your head. Right. So there's a good reason to be noble. It's to do great stuff. And what does it look like? It means a combination of the right technology and leadership, and it means focus on maximizing output for everybody. Okay, so the last time I saw Jens, he was on a stage speaking to a multinational audience about the benefits of intelligent automation effectively implemented in his organization. When he left the stage, it was to thunderous applause, maybe Viking-level applause. I, was, I couldn't be happier for him. And so I said to myself, how can more people have transformations as successful as Jens and Gustav? How could your next transformation look like a full glass of water and not an empty glass of water? I think it's a call to action. 
And the call to action is how do each of us get hold of that lightning and make it happen more often? And people have talked about that for four or five days here, about great examples. But I'd like to simplify it for you in three words. As I watched Jens drive away in his new Volvo when he dropped me off at the hotel, I thought, it's really simple. The call to action is noble automation now. Thank you very much.